Okay, 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 okay. I was gonna wrap up this series, but I think we're gonna need to address something else as well. How to test your code. Because let's face it, a lot of you guys really, really suck at coming up with meaningful examples and testing your design and code. You throw a handful of examples at your code and these examples don't really have a rhyme or reason to them. They're really just random numbers or random strings. Then you try your code, it breaks, and you don't know what your test cases are missing. And in fact, your test cases are probably so convoluted and big that it's really impossible to step through it. And because of that, you end up not being able to see what your design is missing. And today, I'm gonna to tell you how to fix this by setting yourself up for the right tests and thinking about testing in the right way. If you haven't been following this series so far, hi, my name is Edward. I'm an ex-Apple senior engineer and wait, wait, am I gonna get sued for that? I think that's trademarked. Here to help you become a better programmer with the coding interview. During my last round of interviews, I was able to secure offers from four top tier tech companies, including Google and Facebook. The videos I've done so far cover the basis of my system of how I tackle studying and approaching the interview to achieve consistent offers, no matter what level you are or what your programming language is. And today, we're gonna to talk about testing your code during the coding interview. We will come up with a criteria for what constitutes good testing versus bad testing in the context of the interview. After that, we will figure out what principles we should use for testing so that way we can come up with the most complete coverage possible with the fewest and simplest examples just to make sure that your idea is bulletproof. If you like my work and want to support me, please donate to my coffee. Link in the description down below. Also, please like, subscribe, and watch this until the very end. It lets me know you like what I do here and you want to see more content like this. And if you connect with me on my socials, you can actually vote for what topic I cover next. So with that, welcome to the coding interview. You suck. Now, before I continue, I want to highly emphasize that this testing should be done independent of the code you write. While I will write things in code, I just want to highly emphasize that this is only used for illustration purposes. You should be testing based on your design. Let me repeat that. You should be testing based on your design. The idea of what constitutes a good test and a bad test is a very big topic in and of itself. In fact, we could literally write an entire video series or book on that alone. The good news is that because these problems are rather simple, we can actually just focus in on one criteria, coverage. So then why do we only need to focus on coverage? The reason is that the problem and solution are usually very straightforward. The code is small and most problems take very simple inputs and have only a finite range of numbers that are relevant to the problem. As a result, there are no flaky components that you need to rely on. A lot of the things that you will be writing are given to you in the standard library. So the tests are just gonna be on that very simple segment of code. And in fact, are guaranteed to be deterministic and consistent. And because there are only one to two input cases that we actually really care about, test reliability is also not a big issue either. Therefore, the only factor that really matters is coverage and the examples you generate will determine how much coverage there is. Which leads me to the next question. How do we generate tests with wide coverage as simple as possible? Well, in theory, if we tested against every single possible combination of inputs, we would achieve 100% coverage, but that's practically impossible. It would be utterly infeasible to test against every single integer value between zero to two billion or whatever the max value is. So then we need to narrow our cases. And as you can guess by the theme of this entire series, we want to be efficient with our test cases. This means that we only want the minimum number of tests to achieve the maximum amount of coverage. Thus, our first heuristic is that each of these tests should be independent from one another. For instance, if I have a test case that requires me to test on values that are greater than six and greater than three, choosing nine as my test case for both of these cases is actually not the best idea. While you might think this is efficient, the purely best practice test case would actually be to choose two numbers that will not conflict with each other such as nine and five, because these two values can independently test one case or the other. After all, suppose the code in the inside of your function looks like this. So if we want to test the X is greater than three condition and we choose nine as the input, we will never actually trigger that condition. Yet it is very clear that we need to have a test case for six and above and three and above. So choosing independent test cases is actually very important. And while during the interview, you might be able to skip over some test cases or combine them for the sake of simplicity, 
the basic underlying principle is still there and should be considered. Now, as we build our code, it is inevitable that there are conditions that will depend on other conditions. The question then becomes, how do we handle this situation? That is, if our code has nested conditionals, complex logic, and a lot of other things to worry about, then how do we build our tests up in order to handle these? Much like how actual software is built, we will test the independent conditions first. Our second principle is to test the simplest conditions before moving to the complex one. What is important to understand here is that complex code is built from simple code, piece by piece. Once these simple tests are bulletproof, the code that is based on these can actually stand on its own. Let's consider a very basic example, the null check. In a lot of recursion problems, the null condition is very often our base case. So that means for our function, we will need to have at least two test cases, one to test null, one to test not null. Now, suppose we take it up a step. We want to stop the recursion when the counter is equal three. This means that we can further subdivide our non-null cases into when the counter is equal to three or when it's not equal to three. To translate this into actual coding, we will first build the null check and then the conditional. Now, this may seem very obvious and a very small thing. In fact, usually in interviews, the null check itself is very self-evident, but you'd be very surprised to know that people don't actually know how to handle it. In fact, the simple conditional is usually handled as an afterthought, and most people just end up hacking their code to do something like this. Don't worry, we've all done it. Now compared to this, which one do you think looks cleaner? They both do the exact same thing, but you can see how it's easier to build one over the other if you actually consider building up your test cases and building your code alongside that. If you're the kind of person to just write the code and then try and fill out the test cases and exceptions later, then you're more likely to end up with this code. But if you're the person who really takes it step by step, then arriving at this code is actually a lot easier. The more weird and frivolous cases that you can knock out early on and handle with simple code, the fewer things you need to deal with and the cleaner your code will look. It's so easy to write better code when you end up covering fewer scenarios. Writing that one conditional first can allow you to forget about the rest of the complexities. So then, how do you know if you're overdoing it? Or how do you know when your coverage is complete? After all, you can think that you've covered every case, but the question still remains. How do you actually verify this? Should you rely on just the conditionals in the code? Well, the answer to that is no, but it's not a complete no. You shouldn't rely on the implementation of your code to drive your testing necessarily. And yet, on some level, you kind of do. From a theoretical perspective, you would usually approach this similar to how you would prove by cases in geometry, where you would list out all the possible scenarios that your code can handle in a general sense, and then ensure that you solve all of them. This is probably the most preferred because, again, the simplistic nature of the problem means that there are only a finite number of cases that you need to handle. So doing a proof by cases probably means that you only handle, what, three, four cases at most? So then what exactly does this look like? Well, it, maybe it's easier if I give you an example. Let's consider a tree node. In it, we have the possibility of having zero, one, or two children, combined with whether or not we want to pass in values from the ancestor. So in total, we have about six possible combinations. Now, these children can be trees or leaves or null, but in essence, we actually don't really care. Rather, we should be concerned with the return value from these children once we run the function on them. Furthermore, not every problem will need to care about every single aspect. Consider a recursive traversal. It does not care what the ancestor or parent is, so this consideration would actually be thrown out. In the end, to test a normal traversal, whether it's LVR, in order, post order, or whatever, we need to only test against nodes that have zero, one, or two children like here. Of course, not every problem is gonna be this easy. The cases might be a bit muddled and confusing and the range of values that you might need to cover will not be clear. They could be more complex than this or less complex, but hopefully this gives you a taste of how to approach testing. You need to make sure that tests are independent of one another, that code and tests are built from simple cases first and foremost before moving on to the complex ones and that your tests should be representative of all the cases that you will encounter. Okay, that was a lot of information I threw at you guys and it might have been a bit confusing. Plus, this video is getting a bit long. In the next video, I will demonstrate all of this with a toy example. But for now, you should check out this video where I actually solve a problem so you can get some understanding of how I generate tests. 
I'll link it here and I'll link it down below. So thank you for making it to the end. Remember, you can connect with me on my Discord, Instagram, or Twitter, where you can keep up with me and vote on what topics you want me to cover next. If you like this video, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one. Thank you.